Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 44 of Stand Up. Today's question is, what is bioethics and why should you care? Welcome to the classroom of life that is Stand Up with Pete Dominic, which drops wherever you get your podcasts three days a week. I'm continuing my work of fighting apathy and ignorance on my journey to learn more about the world and myself. Every show, I welcome an expert or more, sometimes three, even four, smart, entertaining guests on to talk about the issues, ideas, and problems that matter to you, your family, your community, your health, your planet, your soul, your pet, and everything else. Don't forget, this podcast can only sustain itself because we are ad-free. It's independent media on Patreon.com. Please consider a paid subscription on Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Pete Dominic. I just got done watching 60 Minutes, so I have a 60 Minutes cadence and rhythm down right now, so I thought it would be fun to introduce today's guest as if I were a 60 Minutes reporter. Here goes. Instead of spending so much time listening and contributing to the minute-to-minute controversy du jour on social media and cable news chatter, perhaps... Maybe we could spend more time understanding all of the layers that undergird the many of the larger issues at hand. Bioethics is such an important field of study and of great interest to all of us, whether you know it or not. If you're occupying a human body or love others that do, then bioethics matters to you. We'll all have to have tough conversations with the people we love and who love us about our health or theirs. Bioethics helps us understand how and why we should make individual decisions for ourselves and collective ones for our loved ones and the societies we want to live in. Bioethicists are the experts who study, research, and explain anything from abortion to physician-assisted suicide, organ transplant, genetic engineering, vaccines, and so much more. Dr. Arthur Kaplan of NYU and on Twitter at Arthur Kaplan is one of the most respected bioethicists in the world. And this is my conversation with him in his dining room at his lovely home in Connecticut. In fact, it's become clear that the place to live for all human beings is Richfield, Connecticut. Why is that? You get a dog, you get Dick Cavett, you get the bioethicist. I mean, what? Who else is over here? What the hell do you want? Yeah, but book me a couple (laughs) more interviews. This is the best. I think that it would be really helpful, and I hope you don't mind doing this. I probably could explain it myself just by looking at, you know, definition of bioethics. But bioethics for dummies are the Kaplan. I mean, this is a fairly new field of study, early 70s. You're really one of the most respected people in the field. You've created programs at a number of different universities, now at NYU. For people who don't know that I really want to listen to this conversation, what is bioethics? So bioethics arose out of some pretty specific challenges or problems. One reason we have bioethics is the Nazi medical experiments in the concentration camps. So people said, you know, doctors led those experiments, and doctors ran the ovens, and doctors did the selection when a train would ride up to an Auschwitz or a Belsen-Belsen and pick who would live and who would die, meaning medicine played a pretty big role in that Holocaust, unlike You know, it's not like we're short through human history of mass murders and genocides and so on, but we never had one that was mediated by medicine. You say mediated, but really, we're talking about the fact that physicians and scientists wanted to study all kinds of different issues within the human body, diseases and so on. Right. But it is not ethical to conduct studies on human beings, which is why we get to controversies about conducting studies on animals and so on. That being said, it was, they were the Nazis. Yep. And so why not try to see what body temperature people freeze by or what cure? You, You can't do that in any normal ethical Correct. society, but you, you could do that if you were the Nazis well, the conducting became, a genocide. Uh, so the question is, Germany at the time is the most sophisticated science and medical place in the world. In the 40s, late 30s, early 40s. Absolutely. If you're going to medical school, you want to learn something, you don't go to the hick United States, you go to Germany. Okay. So how could this premier place go so ethically off the charts? That's sort of the question that drives the creation of bioethics. What are they, and, you know, one answer is, well, they're Mengele. They're all nuts. They're crazy. There's fringe people coming to power. 
and Mengele was exactly that description. He was a loon. But it turns out, if you examine him, and that's, again, part of the roots of bioethics, he was fringe for the Nazis. They didn't take yeah, him right. seriously. They didn't care about Mengele. They knew he was nuts. If the German- The angel of death, yeah. Mengele, yeah. The, uh, the, the doctor from Auschwitz. That's Correct. what you're talking about. The guy yeah. that was captured in Argentina, yeah, movies made about this guy, uh, okay. it's that yeah. guy. But even the Nazis didn't take Mengele seriously. He wasn't well-trained. He wasn't a good scientist. And what happened was, when they wanted to do a real experiment, well, why are they doing experiments? Well, some of them, a good number of them, in fact, are, are uh, initiated by the military. Freezing, you mentioned that. They want to know what happens if sailors, airplane pilots, get into cold water. How, do we, how long can they last and how do we save them? People have said to me, well, they didn't produce anything out of that that was any good. It was all, you know, kind of... When, they, when the military wanted to get an answer to a serious question, they got the scientists from the university who were premier. Head of the Koch Institute of Tropical Medicine did all the studies on diphtheria, tetanus, typhus, not some slouch Mengele. Guys who were experts at hypothermia came from the University of Kiel. They did the studies on freezing at the Dachau camp. They ran them. They wrote the results down. So we get the mainstream. And you might say, well, why do we all know about Mengele? And we don't know about these other guys, because after the war, the Germans, in a sense, got rid of their guilt by saying it was only Mengele-type people who did this stuff, and the rest of the guys came back and went to work. So, but you know one thing came out of these experiments, the Nuremberg Code, right? They had a trial, put the doctors on trial. And out of that comes a really fascinating fact that was one of the reasons I got into this and got into this field. I'll tell you a personal note. One of the reasons I got into it is my dad was in the troops that liberated Dachau. Is so, that right? Uh, if you ever see the film of U.S. troops running through the gates at that camp, which is shown once in a while, and you see all these emaciated people, and yeah. he's in it. You can oh, see no him. Oh, no way. You can yeah. see, actually you can recognize see your dad. Wow. Yeah. He died only a few years ago. Oh, wow. And so the, yeah, okay, go ahead. So. That's went, why you got in. Yeah, I mean, your dad was one of the reasons I got liberated. interested. Yeah. Uh, and, I'll, you know, you hear from a lot of people, Jewish background, like me, hey, <laughs> We're here with uh, Arthur Ka at his house with his beautiful Lassie. You may, you, you dog, uh, Kali. It's like Lassie. What's that dog's name again? Lassie. R R oh, this one's Rory. Uh, Rory, lovely dog. You may uh, hear him chime in. But so, so, so the, the Nuremberg Code came out, out of, of these experiments, of putting them to account. Right. And they say in the trial, "How did you guys do this?" And you know, many people, I think you started to say this yourself, if I ever let you talk, you may have said this, but, well, the Germans made me, or the regime made me. It was clear that uh, political people made me. It wasn't that way. Nazi doctors in the uh, Nazi regime prior to the rise to power of Hitler were the profession with the greatest number of members of the Nazi party. They were the eugenicists. If you think about today and you hear people make claims like Mexicans bring us disease or uh, we have uh, situations where we got to watch out for immigrants because they're going to degrade the population. That's the way the Nazi medical profession was talking before there were Nazis. They were fueling Hitler. They didn't get dragged So they believed in. in a master race, and so they didn't have an ethical concern with experimenting on lower forms of— Correct. With that, 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 as they saw it, lower forms of humanity. Correct. And then that group of lower forms, as long as we're listing, people think, well, they were the Jews. There were, but there were also homosexuals. There were also gypsies. There were also Slavs. Poles, Russians were all destined. Anybody with any game. kind of mental illness? Uh, mental illness, yeah. Alcoholism, yes, all of that. Anybody they could put through tests, which, which if we put ethics aside scientifically, you are going to be able to find out better solutions and cures for diseases if you can actually experiment on human bodies. Correct. So I mean, you're going to facilitate things much faster. And for military purposes, they're starting to invent jets. They want to know how high can you fly before you pass out. So they do decompression studies. That's what they're studying. If you want to find out wound recovery, you wound somebody and you try different medicines on them. That's what they're doing. It's not just mingling saying, hey, I wonder if I could transplant eyeballs. Let's see. I mean, nobody cared about that. So, so, so as a result, though, of the Holocaust, of what the Nazis did with these experiments came the Nuremberg Code, which, of course, ends up being the field of bioethics. Correct. Meaning 
we're never going to allow for this again. Correct. You don't have to be a military uh, yeah. that believes in eugenics. We are going to create societies and healthcare systems and school schools of medicine that do not allow for all that. different types of, of behaviors, but specifically <laughs> testing on human beings. And yet, in the United States of America, post Nuremberg, you had Tuskegee. And so that's the second big step. Uh, again, a little before I finished or my Tuskegee. studies, Tuskegee comes Tuskegee. We pass the Nuremberg Code. People start talking about medical ethics, bioethics in a more serious way. But for the next 30 years, the Nuremberg Code is 1947. In 1972 is the revelation that we've been doing an experiment on black men in the South when we had a cure for syphilis, not giving them a cure, lying to them, illiterate black men, I might add, in order to study the effects of syphilis on the human body. When asked, why did you do this? They said, well, they're, they're not real human beings. They're poor black guys. Any familiarity to that argument? Yes, it's what the Germans said at the trial. They also said things like, they're uh, basically sacrificing a few people in these experiments to learn a lot is worth it. Germans said that too, by the way, in Nuremberg. Mm. Tuskegee really blew the socks off bioethics because it was one thing to say crazy Nazis did terrible experiments, and we'll have a lecture or two about that. Mm -hmm. When Tuskegee opened up, there were congressional hearings. There were guys, ancient senators uh, who were willing, I should say, to listen to evidence and look at documents. Walter oh. Mondale, Ted Kennedy, mm -hmm. they all— Those are the days. They all had hearings, and out came this whole story. The studies government funded— 30 years. What the heck is going on here? That's really the roots of bioethics. So you might say human experimentation abuses, whether it's Nazis or us, with uh, racism driving the study. That's really the roots of the thing. Now, what is it today? Well, it's expanded because everything I've talked about so far is research ethics. But we also have rationing, not enough organs around. People don't donate organs. Who's going to get them? That falls into our area. People get terminally ill. They say, I would like some help in dying because I can't endure this or I don't want to lose my dignity. Physician-assisted suicide. That falls into bioethics. You have people saying things like, I, t I want to have access to medicines that aren't yet approved by the FDA, but I'm dying. I don't have a lot of time. Isn't there some way I could get them? That would fall to us. It's called compassionate use of a medicine. So across the board, bioethics today covers everything from genetically engineering your kid. Can you do a head transplant? Does that make any sense? How do you allocate scarce resources? How do we manage our dying so that it's humane? Does that require assistance in dying? Does it require I give you drugs to kill you faster? Um, what would be the trigger? Do you have to be terminally ill? Can you be depressed? That sort of thing. So we have a, a field that runs, if you will, from GMO foods, are they safe, should I eat them, genetically engineered stuff, to genetically engineering us, to distributing the resources we have, to the big challenges, and you know these very well, Pete, why do we have this ridiculous healthcare system that leaves out like 20% of the population? Right. Why don't we have a right to healthcare? Right. And I want to get to the, the, the healthcare system, which you've written a lot about. But let's, let's what do you do, Arthur mm -hmm. Kaplan? I mean, let, you just sit around in your, what is it, a toga with other philosophers and argue the ethics of medicine and healthcare choices? Because the, one of the, the reasons I always love talking to you is not only because it, the field is, is, is fascinating, but, you know, we can sit here and argue about gun violence or the future of energy. Yep. And we're all affected to some extent by, by most of these things. But I feel like all of us are going to be involved with important decisions about either our health care or our relatives, um, likely our parents, likely ourselves, uh, end of life care, or any kind of number of other issues. And so everybody listening can learn a lot from your your study, your research, and your colleagues' research. But what is it that you do? Because you you take into consideration, I guess, three parties: the healthcare provider, the doctors, et cetera, uh, the patient, mm -hmm. and then educators in, mm -hmm. in general about how to teach medicine. Because doctors are very scientific and have to make decisions based on science. But okay. bioethicists teach doctors, well, it, it, it's more than that. It's more spiritual. It's more holistic. Understand what your patient's needs and desires are. So what is it that you do? So 
a typical day for me, and then I'll come back to the roots or the foundations of what's going on. But I might spend some time uh, when I get into work. Doctors will be sending over information about one, two, or three cases that may be giving them problems. A family's fighting. They can't agree on what to do with grandma. Should they pull the plug? The sister says yes. The daughter says no. I'm going to have that sitting on my desk, and they're going to want an opinion. Somebody uh, may be sitting around saying, you know, we have a research trial and someone wants to drop out, but if they do, we'll have to pull their data out of the study and it's going to make it a mess. Do I have to let them drop out or can I keep the data and let them drop out? That is, you leave, but I'll still keep what I learned about you. So those sorts of things are usually lying around from the night before or the day before. I talk with those guys. We sort of work out. So physicians actually want your ethical opinion Correct. on the situation. Just real quick. On grandma, they give you all of the specific statistics of, of her illness yes. and of her diagnosis. Yes. And then do they even bring in like the personal, well, the, you know, the daughter, the father, the, the brother wants, I mean, how specific to, to, of information do you get? That's a good you question. You classified clearances, I guess. <laughs> I do. And so I get, since I'm considered part of patient care, I can look at, you know, I get their records. I know what they know. Mm -hmm. I may say sometimes, geez, I don't understand that kind of cancer. Let me talk to the guy who's a specialist in myeloma because okay. I don't yeah. understand this. Yeah. And they will find that person and put them on to. Then there are occasions when I know exactly what the answer is. Remember I mentioned the sister might be fighting, let's say, with the mother. And I'm going to say, you know, in the order that's established in the laws that we've enacted over the past 30 years... Sisters trump mothers, or husbands will trump uh, parents. They have the decision-making authority. The doc will say, oh, I didn't really understand that, and we're done. That's, you're going to follow, if you will, the directions of the person who has the moral and legal authority. Isn't that usually determined by the patient themselves at some point earlier? Because if they're smart. My assumption is that, unfortunately, a lot of those decisions are made up on who's getting the dough. Well, sometimes it's dough, sometimes it's guilt, sometimes it's you never liked me as much as you did my sister anyway, sure, sure. so we're going to fight that out. Oh, so the sister wants to save her, and, and, and yeah. the, oh my gosh, yeah, yeah so you of get course. Every psychodynamic you ever wanted is yeah, sitting there in wow. these issues. Money, yeah, but I'm not saying it's never there, but huh. it's not as common as you think. Okay. There's a lot of psychology playing out, a lot of guilt, a lot of emotion, that sort of thing. I haven't seen pop in 30 years. I flew in from Arizona. Let's keep him alive because I'm guilty. That kind of thing. And you're sort of like, would Pop want to be this way? I know you feel like you've neglected him, and now you're here, and you want to Yeah, but what about, Pop, what about Pop's dignity himself, and what, what would he want? Are these, are these decisions usually being made because the, the patient is that who, who uh, yeah. can't make them themselves at yes. this point? Yeah. So, and you asked, you know, we're kind of in the middle of what do you do, but to reach down to a where do you get the advice from, or how do you know— so over the past, since I started doing this maybe 40 years ago, 35 years ago, in the old days when I broke into medicine, doctors decided what was going to happen. We didn't have any conversations with patients about any of this. You walked in the room and you said, Pete looks pretty sick. I don't think he's getting better. Yank off whatever stuff we had at that time and let him go. And that was it. You walked out of the room and you said to the family, sorry, Pete's dead, but we did all we could. That's how it went. We pushed back against that in bioethics and said, you know what? Sometimes we ought to make sure that we know what the patient wants. Maybe the patient wants to end it before we do. Maybe the patient has different religious views and they don't want certain things done to them. They don't want blood transfusions. They're a Jehovah's Witness or something like that. Maybe they're a Christian scientist. They don't want to be here at all. Maybe they're a grump. I used to call these guys grumpy old men. We go in and say, you got bad diabetes. we got to amputate your leg. And the guy says... I don't want my leg amputated. Let me die. I don't want to live that way. might not be my choice. I might try to argue with him. But at the end of the day, doesn't he get to decide? So the notion of patient autonomy, which we kind of take for granted today, the idea that I'm going to run my medical care, and if I can't speak, then I'll pick somebody else to do it. That's bioethics contribution. That's one of the main things we did in healthcare. We shifted, we would call it doctor paternalism. They decide for you. Yeah. So you get to decide, and if you can't, you have the right to fill out a living will, advanced directive, listeners will have heard of that, and say, I want Pete to make my decisions, or here is my decision. If I can't speak and I'm you know, unconscious and I can't be brought back to mental life, let me go. I don't want to just be a vegetable. So 
getting, I mean, so much of this seems like it's end of life care. Give me an example on something different, maybe where two parents you know, are in a horrific situation of, of their maybe newborn child. And and uh, is she going to live for a couple of weeks? Is she going to be able to have a decent uh, shot at life, et cetera? I mean, that is also bioethics. And I Absolutely. would imagine that's the hardest kind. Oh, the worst. A, is because... It, situations come up, we read them in the papers of saving this kid who's conjoined twins, we separate them and all these miracles that we can do for babies. But you know, at the extreme, babies are born premature, really premature, like frail, 23, 24 weeks. Hmm. It's about as far back as we can go into pregnancy. And when that happens, we know a couple of things. The preemie baby is likely going to wind up disabled. They just there's just uh, damage done by being born prematurely. The chance of the baby dying at those ages is really high, and it's going to be an enormous burden on the family if the kid lives to take care of the baby. It's just there's going to be a lot required because of the prematurity. Parents, they have this baby. They want this baby. We're not talking an unwanted kid. They very much want to have the child. They're standing by, and they're going to feel, if I don't save my kid, what kind of parent am I? Mm. Ethically. Who, who would say, give up on my baby? So we're trying to give them information and saying, you still have choices because we don't have to be aggressive. If you tell us to dial it back at 23 weeks, we would because we know the outcomes are so tough. I will tell you, 95% of parents say do everything. That's what they want. Really? Oh, yeah. They're, the guilt there and the... And, their view of themselves, their self-image about what, you know, how can I live with myself if I gave up on my little baby? Remember, too, in our culture now, what's the first picture you see of somebody's kid? First baby picture. Uh, right after it's been born, the mother's... Nope. The first sonogram. Baby, yep. They've already identified with this kid. Mm-hmm. They've got ultrasounds. they now got the pictures. Ones, yeah. They're watching them on... I saw. I couldn't believe this. I saw it on Fox News the other day. A little baby wearing a MAGA hat inside the womb. <laughs> exactly. I didn't even know. Did you know that was possible? I had no idea. No, yeah, it was a maybe Hannity <laughs> photoshopped it. Trump well, might have a, sharpie in there. Yes. Yeah, but yeah. So you see that that, that image, and you're then starting you start to bond. It's your kid. It wouldn't have been that way 20 years ago because you didn't have any pictures. So what into are you the saying womb? that it's 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 worse now when you identify because the, it's it's. Totally natural to identify with that. I wouldn't that, use but the word worse, but it's shifting values. For example, mm. one of the reasons we're more conservative in this country about abortion is that we see the fetus early. Another reason is there are people who can now do, get this, surgery when the baby's inside the mother's womb. We repair a leak in the spine called spina bifida. Somebody has what's called a diaphragmatic hernia. It just means there's a rupture in the muscle and the kid's lungs are compromised. You go in when you're still pregnant and fix it. You're talking about a patient who's pre-viability, who's before Roe versus Wade. When you start doing those things, when you image the baby at eight weeks, at 12 weeks, you start to say, that's not a fetus, that's a baby. And so some of the attitudes and values start to change Mm. around humanizing what used to be fetuses unseen, blocked off by the mom, you know, you you couldn't go inside the body to see anything, certainly weren't treating anything. Other people will say, you know what else happened? We now make embryos and dishes in vitro fertilization, another big area for us. That's my kid. I got a picture of the embryo, Mm. right? Yeah. And they want the kid. So they're not saying, oh, it's, you know, potential person. It's like, that's my baby. I've heard that description Again and again. So you say, well, why? I roll on that one just for everybody (laughs) listening. I mean, I I have a hard time with it myself. I I do too. But if you will, the infertility clinic docs, they're like, hey, you're on your road to a baby. We had a success. Well, I understand if you have a really, really hard time getting pregnant and and you desperately want to and you see the very, you know, you see it's not unlike, you know, planting a seed. You see the starter kit. You see the starter kit. You see, you know, it, I get that. And I'm taking it for granted because both my daughters were completely unwanted accidents. You know, we weren't <laughs> even trying. Either. But 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 still, it cloudies, I think, the when does life begin and abortion debate to some extent. Regardless, so, so. Uh, we, you know, I'm flipping around here a little bit. But you said, how does this... Attitudes about caring for newborns that are premature or surgery in the womb. 
they have shifted our cultural debate about abortion, whether you like it or I like it, and whether the science bears it out. I certainly would agree with you that an embryo is not a person. It's got a long road to travel. And you know the failure rate for embryos? It's about 50%. Hmm. So I wouldn't be calling anybody a person at the two-cell embryo stage. It's, right. it's got a long road to go. But nevertheless, there are a lot of folks subtly influenced by all that who start to say, then I don't really want abortion, say, before this or at all, or life begins at conception. They wouldn't have talked that way because nobody could see life beginning at conception. Now it's coming into their, through the TV, it's on social, social media. You can see the pictures. These are the embryos. This is how they develop. Well, so it makes a difference to their psychology. Abortion is obviously one of the most divisive issues in the country, and it's obviously uh, something that you deal with on a regular basis, written a lot about. So yep. my, my, my question, obviously I was going to get to abortion with you in, in, in a longer conversation like this one when we're talking about bioethics. But my question is, in your world, your colleagues of bioethicists, is there great divide? Because it, it just seems to me... I don't think this is that controversial. Maybe it is. But abortion has so much to do with, with your religious beliefs yeah. and, and not so much with, with scientific beliefs. So when it comes to bioethics, do you, in your field, is, is the, are there great debates about this issue? Well, and remember, so what are, they, what we, are we, they like? We were talking a little bit about my day. <laughs> so after I deal with any cases that are lying around, I'm probably going to be working on a particular topic. I might be working on something, let's say... Um, an article on when does life begin? Mm -hmm. Just a little fun thing to open up the morning. Yeah, no you know? yeah. <laughs> Just Brush a, your teeth, okay. you meditate, and yep. write a, a scholarly paper on when life begins. And I'm going to look at the literature, and I'm going to find a lot of stuff written by people from different religious backgrounds. I'm going to find a Muslim view that says life begins at quickening. When the mom feels the fetus moving around, that's the beginning of life. That's mm -hmm. sort of what Muslim religion believes. I'm going to find Catholics who say life begins at conception. I'm going to find... Other views that say life begins when you're born. There's even some philosophers who've made the argument that life doesn't begin until your brain is fully conscious and working. It might be three months after you're born. That's when you're really a person, not even when you're born. So I got a range of stuff out there. And I'm trying to think, that's all great, and I'm interested in the religious views, but what does science tell me? What's the evidence tell me? What do I know about embryonic development? So I know a couple of things. One, I told you, I mentioned embryos after sex, good old natural birds and bees stuff, 55% failure rate if an embryo gets made. That tells me it's true that every life begins at conception, but it also tells me that every conception doesn't begin a life. I can't respect that religious view because it's not based on fact, it's based on mythology. I mean, the Catholic one about yeah. life begins at conception, or the evangelical right. one, if you want to put right. it that way. When does the brain really start working inside a fetus, inside the human being? It's probably about 24, 25 weeks. That's significant. When do I consider people dead? When their brains totally stop working. Maybe I should consider them alive when their brains begin to work. That's symmetrical. If they're, I'm going to say your brain dead, you're dead. How about your brain alive? That gives me another argument I want to use, which I do use. So I, I'm aware, I'll answer it this way. I'm well aware of the religious traditions. Sometimes I think they're based on hokum and bunk and no evidence. They're just inherited views. The Muslim one is interesting. It probably comes from the fifth century somewhere. Yeah. And I don't think it's lined up with the facts. If I'm going to persuade people to change their views, I'm going to have to come pretty well armed with the science and a pretty respectful attitude about their beliefs. I don't go in and say, you know what? You think this two cell thing is a person? You're out of your gourd. Yeah, no, that would be me. You can't. Yeah, <laughs> I don't I, do that. I, I'll do that I on stage, that. Uh, and it'll get great ratings on the radio. But yeah, you, you have that. to approach it with an understanding of where they're That's coming the from. I might even point out this. Do you know that before embryology came into existence in the 19th century, that the Catholic Church's position was? Oh, you point out the discrepancy how it used to be different. Exactly. Well, I, and that means maybe you could evolve. And I'll tell you an even funnier story, which you'll love. Five or six years ago, I get invited to the Vatican. I don't mean to the Vatican, like hang on the outside and look at the pictures. I mean, you're coming in to the inner sanctum and we're going to have you speak to the bishops and archbishops of the Catholic Church. As many as they're having some annual meeting, which they do, and you're the speaker. Wow. So I'm thinking... Who books that gig? 
I don't know, but when the invite came, it came in a uh, box with purple lining and a gold key, and I'm showing it to my wife, Meg, and saying, you know, is this a bomb or what? I mean, wow. what is this thing? Huh. It was a, I mean, they didn't have an angel with a horn, but short of that, it's quite the little invite. Did they know, speaking of which, you had horns? Did that matter? Like, so, that's a really good question, because the first thing I do is I have some Catholic bioethics buddies. I've even written a book with a guy who's a Augustinian priest at Villanova, a good friend of mine, about Terry Schiavo. We can come back ah, to that. Ah, okay. End of life decision. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway, I call him up and I say, strange thing going on here. I got this invite. Do you think it's a one-way thing? I mean, am I coming back? <laughs> <laughs> um and he said, and I said to him, why are they inviting me? I'm pro-choice. You know, I'm like into stem cell research. I'm not, uh, I'm not in the camp. I'm not in the tribe. He says, here's the answer. If I went and I have some of your views and we, I don't know that he'd publicly say what his views are on abortion, but I know that he's at least thoughtful about the whole mm-hmm. thing. Let's put it that way. But if I go, it's a crisis within the Catholic Church. If you go, it's just some dumb heathen who's telling them something that they want to know what the opposition thinks or what the losers think or what the damn think or whatever it is. But get me a Jewish doctor to say this. (laughs) We don't want our Catholic. We don't have to really have an internal crisis. I went. I did the speech. It was great. They asked good questions. Nobody said, well, we can't engage you because you're not starting the same place we are. They were freewheeling. They wanted to know, how do we handle these objections? That's when bioethics works at its best. You put aside your, I can only say this ideologically, and you say, all right, so we have this belief about contraception. And I said, well, you say in vitro fertilization. I said this to the bishops. is immoral. You can't use it. It's the most pro-life thing I ever heard of. Why would you oppose that within marriage? I get it if you're saying two lesbians want to have a kid and you're all freaked out about homosexuality and you don't think that's a way to build a family. Put that aside. You think you think in vitro fertilization is wrong because a married couple who can't have a kid wants to use it? And that little bit of silence, I knew that many of those bishops, maybe they're not going to jump up and down at the point, they get the idea wow. that that's a tough position to defend. Wow. And I think it is. And oh, so of Catholics don't believe it. I, if I did a survey of Catholics in the wow. U.S., IVF for a married couple, they not well, only the, do they use it, they'd applaud it. Yeah, well, I guess the difference between what the Vatican preaches and what average Catholics practice in terms Correct. of contraception and vitro and abortion. And condom use. And they know yeah. this. Yeah. So you're pushing, when you're going across religious traditions, you're sort of saying... Your followers aren't following. You have the crisis. It's not my problem. If I say condoms prevent HIV and you're running around the world saying don't use condoms in an AIDS epidemic, you look like, I'm not going to say this, but you look like a fool. Well, the other, by the way, the other hypocrisy there is you can't be, as this pope is, a champion for the environment and also against contraception. Correct. Because if Correct. population is, is, is the and problem. And this pope, who I admire, yeah. knows that. Yeah, he he's knows it. Know he's not a dope. Yeah, he's yeah. smart guy. He knows it. He yanks his church as far as he can yank them, so to speak. But he's aware of that. Stop he saying knows. yanking church. Okay. So <laughs> the other, the other question, though, just to quickly about abortion is, you know, the other seemingly thing you hear about all the time. People used to call the show all the time and use this one. I hear this argument on this. When does a fetus feel pain? Mm-hmm. And they all like to point to some research that proved when a, a fetus felt. pain. Pain, yes. and I guess the argument there is that they'll 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 feel the pain of the abortion. Actually, Correct. don't know what the argument. That is it. it that's is. A, you're going to stick some big needle in there. W- was there some do? study that, that that was conducted that that was able to demonstrate yes. when a fetus feels pain, and that is a viable study? No. So yes and no. How's that? Good. We're marching right down the bioethics path. Um, the yes part means people took pictures, ultrasounds of a fetus. Uh, when these put a needle in there for amniocentesis. You know, we do testing to see what is the baby at risk of a genetic disease. And when the needle gets near the fetus, sometimes it pulls away. Therefore, the paper says, it must be feeling pain. My argument is, you could do that experiment, pardon me for saying this, with a frog and it would pull away. You could do the experiment with a bug and it would pull away. There are reflexes, sure, that if you have a sensation you don't like, you move away from it. Or is even that light. F- is that feeling pain? I don't think so. I think you need what we would call in the 
physiology side, a cortex. You need the top part of your brain mm. that's the sentient part. When that gets damaged, we're in a coma. That's Terry Schiavo and uh, many other of our big bioethics cases. I don't think you can feel pain until your brain is fully developed. So pulling away from light or a stimuli, I don't conclude that's feeling pain. But if you're ideologically oriented to wanting to do that, that's how you read it. Right, right. Bias. Uh, l- let's talk about the healthcare system and how bioethics uh, looks at that. And when we think about, this is how I've been taught to think about healthcare, how, wherever and governments, we think about access, quality, and cost. Mm-hmm. Those are the, the three pillars. And I would imagine that you, being the expert, have to look at all of those as mm-hmm. well. You know, who should have access to health insurance that gets them affordable health care? Should we all have equal access? Should we all be afforded the same costs? And we can talk, obviously, about the price of, of prescription drugs, which you have a recent article about, and all kinds of different things. It's just that since we're American and we're talking about this in America, it's helpful always to take a look at how the rest of the world does it, civilized, wealthy yeah. nations, and they spend far less and they generally get better outcomes. But there's something different about America, and I would give you my opinion, but I want to know in terms of your field of study and, and how bioethicists look at healthcare systems in terms of quality, cost, and, uh, and affordability. No, quality, access, and affordability. Costs and so a little same. history question. Yeah. Who do you think were the first proponents of uh, national health insurance? For In America? Yeah. First proponent of national health insurance, Teddy Roosevelt. Probably Teddy Roosevelt and his big supporters around 1905, 1910 in the American Medical Association, which has Doctors. long since abandoned <laughs> its commitment to national health insurance. But way back in the day... They were for it. They liked the idea of getting paid regularly, securely. I'm not sure they were as motivated by the benefit to the patients, but it's 1905. They're not doing a whole lot that helps patients. The opponents, unions. Unions. Why? Because America, it's pluralism, it's racial and ethnic diversity. To get people to join unions, if a Polish guy was going to join a union with a Czech guy, with a German guy, with a whoever, they wanted health insurance to come through the union. Weirdly, our country, because of the diversity that we babble on, many of us, and say we love, it undercut the movement nationally to create a national health insurance program. It was a benefit that you got, and today that's transformed into this idea. You don't have a right to health care. You have to earn it because health care comes through work. Right. Employment. And that's where it comes from. So we have this – the big value that screwed us up is linking health insurance to employment. Right. Why would I want my boss at the factory to decide my health plan? I mean, really? Could we be stupider? I don't think so. And why would we say you have to earn health care? To me, it's a right. The British after World War II, after they all got blitzed and pounded into oblivion, said, we kind of reward the citizens. They went through a lot. We're giving them all health care. That's the National Health Service. Canada said, we believe in community. We think we ought to help our neighbor. We're going to have national health insurance. Kiefer Sutherland's grandfather, Tommy Correct. Douglas, he's seen as like their Lincoln. He's They're like Manitoba, the, the, the guy who Manitoba, brought them, I think Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. The, the guy who brought... Canada, their national health care system called Medicare, is seen as one of the greatest Canadians ever. And, and, the, and we have never sat down, even in the Clinton health reform, the Obama health reform, which were minor in my opinion, and stated clearly, health care is a right. And you know why it's a right? Because you owe it to your neighbor whose kid is born with diseases that they're not responsible for, or you have a genetic thing that, or you, I don't know, a brick fell on your head, you didn't do anything, and... Why wouldn't we help our neighbor? Plus one other very American idea. Isn't healthcare important if you want to have equal opportunity in a market? I mean, don't you have to be somewhat healthy to compete? Aren't we committed to equal opportunity? At least we yap about that all day. If you don't commit to the right to healthcare, you're never going to get off the dime here. And if you don't break that link to work. But, but don't you think that, it, that most people, if, if you explained it, well, frankly, if I explained a lot of this, they would generally agree. And that the, the reason why it has changed is because in this country, certainly because of, of the type of capitalism that we practice, we put profit above people. And so 
the special interests uh, from the hospitals, the pharmaceutical companies, et cetera, they understand how to make millions and millions of dollars. They buy these uh, politicians let's, in this. Let's trade that to trillions, bi- of, trillions dollars. of dollars. <laughs> they, because of our system of campaign finance, influence the politicians to create legislation that allows them to do whatever they want to do. And then they sell that messaging to the pundits and media yeah, that yeah. are able to say, why should I have to pay for your health care if you're not working hard? You're lazy, as if. Uh, to have less means you are less. Right. To have more means you are more. Th- we've hoodwinked everybody because of the for-profit system here. In reality, we're really not that far away from each other because health insurance is simply more people in the pool, the, the cheaper it's going to be for everybody. So that is one point that gets lost if we would just extend the darn thing to everybody. Um, if you want to call it Medicare for all in the current parlance, I don't care. But if you just extended it to everybody, you'll have more people kicking in. I believe that everybody should be paying health insurance like they pay their phone bill. I mean, I, I, I hear people complain to me and say, well, I can't afford, you know, da-da-da-da to pay the premium. And I know the premiums are high, but then I see they're paying, you know, whatever it is, 500 bucks a month to have cable. And you're sort of like, buddy, look, health care, it's not going to be dirt cheap. If we could also agree on a standardized let's call it paperwork system or electronic system, everybody on the same framework to bill. We don't have 100 different companies requiring 1,000 different people. Yeah, it's a nightmare in every doctor's office in America. And it's a nightmare in every hospital. Mm -hmm. And you cut all that out. If you extend the safety net to everybody and make them pay, and you get rid of all this middleman bureaucracy that the private sector requires, you're going to start to drop the cost. However, you're also going to lose jobs. So one thing you didn't mention is... In the private health insurance industry or... The health insurance industry we have today is the biggest make-work program ever seen. All the administrative people, bureaucratic people, electronic medical record people, I don't know what other people, there's a zillion of these. It's like one reason we don't move isn't just that there are greedy guys at the top making a fortune, and there are, but it's also like if I actually cleaned out... All these people who are doing all the paperwork administration. I'm unemploying people all over the place. So I got that problem to deal. But let me get to one other thing. Trump came in. He said, I'm going to go after the drug companies. I'm going to do something about prices. Nothing's happened. Drug prices. Obama reform didn't get anything done about prices. Prices are not so hard to do something about. The problem is the incentives are all in the wrong direction. If you really want to drive prices down, the system now says... Come up with a drug that uh, really helps people with, I'm going to call them rarer diseases, not diabetes, not cancer, but oddball genetic diseases. Charge what you want, serve a small population, and all the drug companies are oriented toward that kind of research. we got to give them more incentives to say, if you fix something or make diabetes easier or arthritis easier, the chronic lifestyle diseases, we're going to give you the returns on that. They don't make their money in the right direction. Other big problem, when's the last time they had a hearing about prices in Congress or a state? Yeah, that's a great, great point. I feel like we might have had one in this in this, in this this house uh, <laughs> since Democrats took over. I yeah. feel like there might have been something about but that. But it's like, but, but yeah. so if I say this drug costs X and people sit around and nod and say, oh, okay, yeah. really? No accountability? <laughs> I mean, who gets away with that? Right, you just come right. out and say, yeah. I'm Martin Shkreli. This costs, uh, sorry, $200,000. And if you want it, pay me. Yeah. Ridiculous. Dirtbag. Uh, but legal, apparently, in, in these Very. Years. Also, As uh, he kept pointing out, I have to say. The only, uh, the only, I think, uh, one of two countries in the world that advertises another drugs. Another all these pharmaceutical ads that we hear all over the place. abomination. By the way, I'm sorry. I've got to do a live read right now, Arthur. Uh, <laughs> Do you have pain? Uh, but yeah, ask that, your doctor ask about. Ask your doctor. I'm sure he'll love it when you ask him. Hey, when you told a, him this commercial told you to ask him. Here's an idea, and it's always a him, by the way. If isn't you it? if you have to ask him, I got an idea. Get a new doctor. Yeah, there you he go. He doesn't know what medicines are out there. You have to come in and tell him. Hey, I saw this thing on TV. Do you know anything about it? You're a cancer expert. Or? A TV, <laughs> on a billboard, and a magazine on the radio. Yeah, I mean, maybe they, in my sleep. I they don't, don't advertise for pharmaceutical drugs anywhere else in the world. No. And it's ridiculous. People say to me, 
you know, what's the biggest driver of demand? It's this very successful direct-to-consumer stuff because what they're yeah, selling you is name band drugs. They don't say, and by the way, there's a generic too, costs a third of the price, but don't don't ask them about that. I feel like Obamacare did something about these pharmaceutical reps and the relationships with the doctors. No, it didn't. Didn't. No. Everybody wants to believe that. What happened was the industry found out that they could make a lot more money direct to consumer and just gave up on marketing to the doctors. Is that That's right? All. So yeah. they stopped sending them on retreats yeah. and giving them uh, yeah. all kinds of freebies. And, and, you know, tickets to baseball games and all that. Uh, lots more to talk about that. but I, I, and, and so many things. I can talk to you for five hours, of course. <laughs> but I, I feel like because it's so important right now, we're watching uh, an epidemic play out in China. Uh, we're talking about the, the virus there, the Wuhan virus. And mm-hmm. more importantly, by the way, every time I bring it up, and I've been bringing it up a lot on the new podcast here, we got to talk about the flu. So what I wanted to talk with you about is is vaccines. We've okay. talked about this before. And it's not just what, you know, the most obvious one that people know about, the kind of anti-vax movement, the conspiracy theories yep. that have unfortunately taken hold, but it's also what how China is handling this outbreak, how any nation may handle an outbreak. We're talking about quarantines. We're talking about all, all different kinds of, of, of regulations, uh, the airport screenings. Mm-hmm. Wear masks. Uh, the, yeah, all of it, forcing people to wear masks, or, or should they sell the masks? Should they get, mm-hmm. What are some of the, the issues that are jumping out? So with this is the clearest uh, issue. Uh, you know, it, we're kind of tracking a little bit the virus of the month here, like a calendar club. But not so long ago, measles was uh, driving us all nuts. And I we're live in Rockland County. We're yep. very proud. Center of the measles yep. epidemic. Yep. So, very simple statement. When you have viruses that change or mutate and start to get nasty, whether it's the coronavirus that is basically a cold virus that just mutated naturally and became much more virulent, kills us as opposed to just making a sneeze, or swine flu, or Ebola, or anything else, the best weapon we've got is vaccination. Everything else is it's Swiss cheese. I mean, you can quarantine for a while, it helps, but it really doesn't do much. What the hell are you doing there? The dog is scratching <laughs> the lovely rug here. Yeah, don't do that. You know, what? it has something to do with, I think your dog's an anti-vaxxer. I think this is making... <laughs> She's like... Don't listen to this part. Um, so <laughs> the best thing is vaccines. Best thing and, is but vaccines. But we don't have a vaccine. You, you can't just develop a vaccine overnight because of the way that uh, they, the they things mutate. mutate. Yeah, yeah. The simple statement is this: because there's so much doubt about vaccines, because the anti-vaxxers hold sway with too many congressmen, we haven't invested enough in the infrastructure to make new vaccines fast. We Wait, could. I've never heard that. We could. Why you, really? The anti-vax so, movement has has. Actual influence oh, in yeah. policymakers oh, yeah, at this yeah, point? Yeah. How many hearings has Congress had on autism and vaccines? About had, $2 billion? I did not know that. Oh, I yeah. really did not know that. That's so, terrible. Donald Trump. Remember when he was running for president? I've heard that. Yeah, it was one of the worst moments. He was standing <laughs> next to Ben Carson. Exactly. And, and, and who, the, yeah. Who was like, He's on the record as an anti-vaxxer, much less a lot of other science. So there you got a real problem because the enthusiasm uh, – you might wonder, why is it hard to get flu vaccine that matches the strain that comes out? Right. There's some technical reasons, but here's the biggest one. We make vaccines like Louis Pasteur, meaning we grow them in chicken eggs. You take the vaccine, whatever the sample is that you get from Australia when it first breaks out, and you dump it into an egg, and it grows in the egg, and then you extract it, and then you start manufacturing the vaccine. So you need like a gazillion chicken eggs. I mean, the Tyson people help us make vaccines. Pasteur would recognize this mode of production. We map the genome. We should be making flu vaccines out of little snippets of DNA and figuring out what the antibody is to that, not chicken eggs. What kind of production thing is that? So the whole industry, when somebody tells me farmers doing this because it's a big plot and they want to make profits, they the, the anti-vax. Manufa- when the anti-vaxxers yeah. say that, there's not... They have this antique system. The big money's in the drugs. It's not in the vaccines. I'm not right. saying they don't make any money. But right. if you're smart and you're a pharmaceutical company, you get out of vaccines. It's that simple. So we right. have a few doing it. We got new knowledge from genetics that should allow us to make really fast, effective vaccines. HPV is a good one, by the way. Doesn't hurt anybody. It's wiped out. Can, uh, cervical cancer. Cervical cancer. Catch your Britain. daughters, especially your daughters yeah. and sons. Well, but, sons can be carriers, so important yeah, to get no, them I, too. I, Reports I, coming out of Britain, Wales, uh, HPV infection has gone to nothing. Australia, for, complete success. What are we doing? Not much. We doodle around. We with hope HPV. That people, yeah, we hope people get it. So hmm. with epidemics like the one we're seeing, 
we've abandoned our best weapon. We got to do something about that. Second thing, we know that a lot of the uh, uh, reason that some of these uh, outbreaks occur is that people are around and close to live animals. That fact, that uh, outbreak came out of China and Wuhan. Yeah, a wet market. From a wet market at, yeah. where you're killing the chicken on the spot. Well, could we like stop that? Right. Is that like a good idea? Right. So having regulations for where food is, is handled. Exactly. And, and, you know, killing a live animal because, yeah, it'll be fresher and taste better. Correct. Yeah, well, you That's can't do it. That's not really a great right. plan. Right, And then as climate change brings us closer to the forest as we hack them away, right. then the bats are around and the bats bite us and we get Ebola and other diseases and that way. And... Climate change is not unrelated to epidemics. I know right. people don't put it together, but it's like yep. if you're moving more and more into the woods – more likely you're going to get bitten by somebody. So fighting fighting climate change, developing vaccines uh, using best science and mm-hmm. creating regulations that Fun won't allow... Fun food handling, these... yeah. what you do with live animals. Yes. What about the bioethics around you know forcing people to be quarantined, forcing people to not be able to travel, yep. uh, to, to have to wear a mask, uh, to have to submit to a test? Even? Well, the good news is about quarantines... I mean, I think they're fine. I think you can do it, but it just buys you time because there's too much human leakage. They get out of the quarantine. Mm. You know, we're going to quarantine, says China, 55 million people or something. Well, by the time they get around to doing that, the thing has already been going on for a couple of weeks. People have traveled all over the place. They're not showing symptoms. They're already vectors, if you will, spreading the disease. I don't think China wanted to admit to this thing right away. They finally did, and then they went nuts. But you got to be on the ball with quarantine, like from the first out, you know, the first go. Otherwise, there's just too many people traveling around right, the world. It's just not going to be effective. It's not yeah. going to be. I mean, you buy time. It's not nothing, but it's not effective. Right. And, and by the way, imagine you and I are both near New York City. Imagine somebody saying, well, you're going to quarantine Manhattan. Really? I mean, you don't think people are going to be going out, sneaking out, I mean, or just yeah. saying, screw you. Impossible. I'm not doing that. Yeah, well, I mean, it's natural, too. Like, I don't want to be quarantined. I want to be stuck in here where I'm more likely to get uh, contract the virus. I'm, so, yeah. but American values, right? It's like, you can't make me do that. I'm not going to well, stay. Yeah. I mean, you you'd be. Tell me what to do. Yeah. Sure. That'd yeah. be. Especially not the government. Exactly. So, I, I want to, I guess, uh, wrap up by talking about kind of the future. Hey, by the way, I do have to tell you one reminder about quarantine. Yeah, go ahead. There was one nurse, got sick with Ebola, or exposed, excuse me, exposed to Ebola, came back from Africa, you may remember, wound up at Newark Airport and was put in a plastic tent. She stayed there about a week and then said, you know what, this is BS, and ran away and went to Maine. We couldn't quarantine one nurse at Newark Airport for a week. It's a <laughs> so great it's example like, of how ineffective. Are you kidding me? Right. I, yeah, yeah, I got to go. I'm out of here. <laughs> uh, so now we, we have mapped the genome and we have all this genetic uh, technology and awareness and science. And there's a lot, obviously, of bioethics in terms of, of how you can engineer all types of, you know, what you want your baby's gender to be, their eye color to be. Uh, and obviously, some really interesting things about being able to solve and cure diseases so that people can have healthier longer lives. How much of your time do you spend grappling with these more modern yeah. genetic uh, issues? And maybe give an example of one that people... A lot. So again, Bioethicist Day, I'm going to go to a talk. I happen to work at NYU. We have a lot of good uh, world-class scientists. I live in New York City. We got plenty of other world-class scientists, cutting-edge genetics uh, science work. I got to show up at those talks so I know what they're doing. Somebody tells me, I think we could do X, Y, or Z, edit our babies so that they're smarter. And I go to the talk and the guy says, you know what, I can barely edit this gene in a bacteria to make sure that it doesn't grow twice as fast. I don't quite have to worry yet about editing the babies. I see where the science is. It's a long way. I mean, it's, not, it's going to come. I'm not denying that, but it's not here yet. So some of what you got to do is stay up to date with where the science really is if you're going to solve the real problems. Yeah, really. I'm not lying. It's true. And oh, then... Somebody doesn't like <laughs> the latest science. Stay up to date with the science and then be practical. People say to me, well, you know, what if we have commissions and international groups and they say, you can't edit babies, you can't try to make them smarter because it would be unfair. We'd have people who couldn't do it and people who could do it. And I know that's nonsense because it's not going to stop anybody, right? I mean, what the WHO is going to issue the genetics police and they're going to hmm. come to the scientist's house. Right. 
That, it doesn't work that way. But I'll tell you what does work. You tell a scientist you can't publish and you can't patent and you can't show up at a meeting and tell anybody what you did and you can't get any credit, you got them. So that's the kind of thing I'm writing about. I know the culture. I know the tribe. These guys, if they wanted to make money, they'd be off in industry. What they want is fame. What they want is recognition. What they want is the glory. Right. You take it away, you can control them. Oh, that's interesting. And that's why that, China, that doctor in China got in trouble. Correct. Because even China, the Chinese government felt said, the pressure to crack down. We got to do something with this guy. And basically, they banned him. They sort of said, we're wiping you out. Nothing bothers a scientist more than finding out. I discovered this, and I can't let anybody know, not just because they want the knowledge to transfer. They want the credit. Uh, let's do a bioethics lightning round. The question over selling your organs. I'm I'm poor. I really need the money. Somebody's going to pay thirty grand for a kidney. Should that be a market? Paid it. Two reasons. One, you get sicker people doing it who don't admit that they have risky lifestyles, so you get poor quality organs, hepatitis, HIV, whatever. We can't test for all that stuff. It slips through. The other reason I don't like uh, payment is I think you're just exploiting people. If the only thing you can do to make money is sell your kidney, that's a one-shot thing. You'll get thirty grand. You still don't have a job. You're still going to be poor. Uh, what about the idea of – I think you might have said this once on the show – uh, a policy where you have to opt out, not opt in to organ transplant, so that we're all on the list unless we choose to not be in the list. Love the idea. My idea. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> so yeah. the basic idea is, why don't we just assume everybody wants to be an organ donor, which, by the way, polls show the majority of people do, and then make sure that if you don't want to do one, you put your name in a computer or you carry a card or you tell your wife, I don't want to do this, or your partner. It's still choice. It's just coming from a different perspective. And we already know what's the trick to getting kids to eat vegetables in the school lunch line. You put the vegetables first. You presume that that's the thing that they're going to pick the most of. You could put them at the end and then they fill up on junk. And by the time they get to the vegetables, they don't want to get any more vegetables. All that this presumed consent idea does, it says, let's presume you want to do it. It's more encouraging. We'll get more organs. But it doesn't uh, make you do it. Physician-assisted suicide, number of countries, now states are allowing for Ten. It. Ten states? Mm-hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts? I like it. I am in favor of it. I believe that the terminally ill should have the right to die the way they want. You might even say, would you choose that? I'm not sure I would, but I think it ought to be out there as an option. I think as opposed to someone who's just suicidal, terminally ill, or... Or if you've been pronounced terminally ill, six months to live, and you say, I don't want to go through hospice, and I don't want to go through these chemo th treatments at the end, I want to go now, okay, I'm for it. But you got to have the protections in. you got to make sure that you're competent, that you wait, you know, got a waiting period, nobody's trying to get your money. Uh, but we do that in this country. The danger is in some other countries, they say it isn't terminal illness that triggers it, it's whether you say you're suffering. People show up and say, I got divorced, I'm suffering. Uh, I lost my kid, I'm suffering. Uh, I had a bad romance, I'm suffering. And they're in Belgium and Holland, they're starting to let those people mm. have doctor-assisted suicide. That I oppose. Uh, what about, is there anything, a bioethics issue on addiction that we could that, that comes up a lot? I mean, just the idea of, of legalizing drugs, allowing people to use yeah. drugs regularly. So them. a couple of things on that. It's clear that we ought to have medical marijuana use everywhere. Why wouldn't we? If people say they get relief from it, I'm all for it. I don't really care that we don't understand it. It's just like... Okay. Um, recreational marijuana, I think probably ought to be uh, allowed at this point, although I would like to study it as it rolls out and becomes legal, mm -hmm. just to make sure that kids don't abuse it or whatever. Um, I think that risk reduction with clean needles for addicts, it works. Works in Zurich, works in Vancouver. I hope they're going to start it in Philly soon. It's pretty clear that if you give people clean needles and give them a little speech when they come in about don't use heroin or whatever, it's better than the current policy. Right. So, yeah, I think we could move addiction along in a big way. And it would also be nice to take some of those uh, executives who lied and sold opioids to doctors and had them prescribing like crazy and uh, lock them up. Yeah, I'm all for that. You've got an article about that recently as well. And lastly, this one's a – I think this is tough. Maybe it's not. Uh, we, we hear so much now about gender reassignment, transgender. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm eight years old and I'm a boy, biologically a boy, but I really identify more as a girl. I feel like I'm a girl. I'd be more comfortable being a girl. I see there being a real struggle in terms of having 
a surgery as a young person for any number of issues yep. because that might that kind of thing is life altering permanently. It's, I don't know. Maybe you can change back, but it, to me, it, it, it's a tough one. And I want to I want to say wait till they are an adult and they can make that decision for themselves before you have a surgery, much less so just issue so the drugs. Clear, this is a tough one. It is really tough because if you do the surgery before they go through puberty, you don't have to do so much surgery. You stop the development oh. of the organs. Oh. So that's so why... So it's easier if you do the surgery yeah, before puberty. Exactly. Oh, wow. Okay, that's why that... the pressure's there to say, okay. I'm 11 and I haven't grown breasts and I, you know, my testicles haven't descended or whatever the... Uh, second, I don't have a beard. Give me the drugs that won't let that happen. Got it. I'll stay this way or whatever. So that really is hard. I still lean toward thinking... We don't know enough about the impact in terms of satisfaction of doing the surgeries and of allowing people to go in a certain direction. If the puberty blockers are reversible, I can live with that. But the surgery itself, for someone who's 13, 14, I would wait a little bit until they got older. I, you look at the data, and it's not like people are jumping around with joy who've been through some of the transgender sure. procedures. But but is it a, is that one something that it feels very rare? Well, I think it's a fascination for people to change sex, right? I mean, it's like sure. Whoa. <laughs> but I mean, a young person really, you know, identifying. I mean, no, I, no, no, I just meant. We all pay attention. Even it's a small phenomenon. I mean, it's tiny. That's it's what just, I thought. Yeah, it's like. It's just bizarre to us. Yeah. I mean, who could ever think about changing your sex in the history of humanity? That's right. un unbelievable. You know, the number of shows on uh, cable and so it on. It makes it seem like it's It's like everybody common, is an epidemic. It's right, not. Right, right. It's tiny. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Hey, I that was love, great. Thank love you. love talking to you. we got to do it again very soon. But this is the introduction. If you, uh, if, if you weren't familiar with Arthur Kaplan, Dr. Kaplan at, at NYU, and, uh, of course, bioethics in general, I want to do a lot more of this because we're all touched by this, and having access to you is a real privilege and pleasure. Thank you so much hey, for your time. thanks for having me. And, uh, and for your— And my dog, and for your, you too. And for your dog, who is uh, <laughs> really kind of archaic with some of her uh, views. I'm a little disappointed. All right. Arthur Kaplan, follow him on Twitter, and uh, I'll give you all the links in the show notes to all of his work and articles, etc. Thank you. That's all the time we have for Dr. Arthur Kaplan and a conversation about bioethics for today's episode. All right, I gotta stop. I can't be. I can't continue the sixty minutes, guy. Uh, that was great. Thank you very much to Dr. Arthur Kaplan. Follow him on Twitter at Arthur Kaplan. Wednesday, uh, the next episode looks like I will have a return visit in person with the great Peter Coyote, who is one of your favorite guests so far that I have uh, had a conversation with here on the podcast going to sit down with him hopefully tomorrow and bring that to you on the next episode of Stand Up. As always, please sign up for a Patreon subscription. Really appreciate it. Over 318 people subscribing with paid subscriptions. Going to have a big announcement on Patreon about how you can help more. That's patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Pete Dominic. Only way we can tin continue doing this podcast so please subscribe for a couple bucks and i'll talk to you on wednesday